Hello, beautiful ladies. I s Wait, am I not in a room of beautiful ladies? I said, hi, beautiful ladies. Hi, everyone. My name is Toti. I'm just here to welcome you to our first ever ladies conference, Dear April 2024. Who's excited to be? No, 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 I need more energy than that. This is our first ever lady conference and you're here. This is history. Who's excited to be here? Oh, lovely, 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 lovely. Today is going to be so incredible. This conference is gonna be incredible. We have such a beautiful lineup for you tonight. We have Emmy Moore coming all the way from the States to be here. Wow. Um, we also have Bridge Music. They are, they are my favorite, they are my favorite music group ever, honestly. My job here is very simple. I just want everyone to get in the headspace of what's about to happen tonight. And tomorrow morning and tomorrow night, you're not gonna leave the same way you came in, amen? There is absolutely no way that you can be in his presence, in his midst, and leave the same way. So for the entirety of this conference, I want you to set an expectation. Because God, he wants to do something in each and every one of your lives. But that can only happen when you set a demand on him. So for the rest of the conference, even as we go into the promo video, set an expectation. What is something that you need God to do in your life? What is something that has been on your heart that you need to be lifted? Amen? That is my job. Well, you'll see me back. <laughs> but my job is very simple. Set an expectation. Be excited. Fellowship. Meet. There are so many women here. I think all y'all about to be my besties, for real. Get to know someone that you've never seen before. Get a, get a new follow. Get a new number. You know, this is, this is such a beautiful community that's about to prosper out of this. And not only will it happen in this conference, but it's gonna go beyond it. In five years, people are gonna ask you, oh my God, how do you know her? Dear April Crop in 2024. And so <laughs> that's all I have to say. I'm super excited for what God is about to do in this place. And I know each and every one of you guys is gonna be completely blessed and completely transformed. Alrighty, bye guys.
Dear April 2024, how we feeling? Dear April 2024, how we feeling? Can we please rise to our feet? Can you greet your neighbor and say, hey girl, you look good, I love your dress. You really snatched up that face. Wow, how can you walk in those heels? Who is ready to give the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Ancient of Days, the I Am that I Am, your Father, the greatest shout of praise? Come on. Well, where we're from, on the other side of the river, we like to worship at the front. So feel free if you don't want to. Okay, I got one girl. Who's going to join her? You going to leave her alone? Come on, grab your neighbor and say, come on, let's go. Put your hands together. Yeah. More like it. Come on. All right, say after me. Everything that I pray. Praise the Lord.
I don't know about you, but I feel his presence in here so strongly. Lives are going to change after this conference. You will not leave here the same way you came in today. Jesus, we are here for you and you. 
throughout the weekend, we're going to have so much in store for you guys. We're also going to be selling some merch. We got some sweaters. It's going to be in the back, so you're more than welcome to buy some after service. We don't have a lot, so if you want to, make sure you do run. Do not walk. Run to grab your merch, your Dear April merch. As well as we are going to have a cafe. We're going to be selling some drinks. We're going to be selling some cute mocktails and a lot more stuff, so save your coin for that. And not last but least, if it is your first time in this building, if it is your first time here at Bridge, can you just put your hands up? I see a lot of new faces. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Well, if you don't know too much about us, we are Bridge, we are youth church, and honestly, we just love God and we are crazy about God. We meet every Saturday here in Ottawa at 3 p.m. and we just worship God because we love him so much because he is a good God. If you are in Ottawa and you do not have a home church, our family is an ever-growing family. Our pastor, Pastor Ralph Darte II, also known as Prophet, is always looking for new members in our church, all right? Well, with that being said, you're more than welcome to actually have your seats. We're going to be getting into the program. And let's actually just make some noise as we welcome Toti the Poet. With my ego as my GPS and my heartbeat as the pace. Facing the world alone because who could possibly know me better than myself? I turned corners I wasn't supposed to and took shortcuts to get to the finish line quicker. I indulged in things that would only satisfy my physical being while I let my spirit starve. I was thirsty quenching my throat because the water from my well only temporarily fixes my craving, my yearning. But oh, with a pride as big as mine, I would never let them, sh I would never let them see my weak hand. So I kept moving, straying further and further away because I knew what I was doing, right? Wrong, wrong turn, I should have turned right and now I'm left behind. I mean, I did feel a tug on my heart to go back, but I thought it was heartburn, <laughs> heartbreak. Why would I go back to those who hurt me? Healing is overrated. They don't deserve my forgiveness. I'd rather hold a grudge. I mean, I did feel the wind push me in a certain direction, but I've always been too scared of things I couldn't control. So I stayed in my comfort zone, comfortable in my routine, comfortable in my sin. Because if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I was too scared to go back. Because what would they think of me? My identity wrapped in the words of the world, my world a confusing mess and overthinker's nightmare. I had hit rock bottom. But then I remembered a story my mother used to tell me about a boy who took his inheritance and left home. He lived his life just as I did mine, assuming tomorrow was promised, living lavishly until there wasn't a penny left. But we differed in one way. He went back home and was greeted with open arms. I had no father to go back to, no relationship to go back to, so I bursted out in tears yelling, where is my father? And in the gentle voice, I heard, I'm here, I've always been here. And I realized that in that moment, I was trying to fill an empty space. I was trying to fill my empty vase. Though I believed I walked through life alone, he was always in attendance, never missing a day. The pull on my heart was him. The wind that blew was him. The, his silence never negated his presence because he was never silent. I just couldn't hear him. This whole time, I had a father to go back to. He knew me better than I knew myself, and he loved me before I was even born. As I took my first steps, I could hear the angels singing of my return. Every footstep and a message to the enemy that he had lost. I shouted and was glad. 
with all my heart. For he had taken away the judgment. He had taken away the shame. He had rejoiced over me with gladness and silenced me with his love. A love that I had never experienced before. A love that would be faithful to me even when I wasn't faithful to him. A love that would leave the 99 because I was so desperate for his presence. Everything makes sense now. You were the soil I needed to anchor my roots. I didn't know I was empty until you made me full. I didn't know who I was until I got to know you. You planted a seed so it could bloom, watered in favor and it blooms, shined your merciful light and it bloomed. Every thorn was removed by your hand, every curse broken, replaced with a prophetic word over my life. You set me on a new path of righteousness, the Holy Spirit directing the way. I felt so at peace knowing that you created a way for me out of the darkness. No need to be worried because you are Alpha and Omega. No need to be anxious of what life may bring because you are, you are Emmanuel, God with us. I am not broken for your grace is sufficient enough for my shortcomings, for your shortcomings, for our shortcomings. Oh, I will sing and rejoice. Oh, I will sing and rejoice of your faithfulness, King of Israel. Your daughter of Zion has returned. Oh, can we just give it up for Toti? What a beautiful poem. I'm so happy to see every single one of you here. You're all looking beautiful. You're all looking lovely. Before we enter into our next moment, I just want to invite everyone to get into a deeper moment of worship. So if you guys could just be up on your feet. And you guys can lift up your hands. It's a sign of surrender to God. God is already moving so powerfully, but we've just started. And he wants to encounter us individually. He wants to encounter us in an impactful way. And if you came here expecting God to change you, change a situation, expecting that you wouldn't leave the same, I'm happy to tell you you're at the right place. And so for just one minute, I invite you to just open up your mouth and just begin asking God to encounter you fresh. God wants to move needs our surrender. And so as your hands are lifted, just begin crying out to God. And it's a simple prayer. We're just saying, God, we need you. God, we need you. God, we need you. Our Savior, our Father, Holy Spirit, we need you.
situation. God is about to change your name. You're not your trauma. You're not your shame. You're not what you've been through. So we're going to sing this out with everything in our hearts. We're singing it out. Sing that song for me. What I've wanted. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place.
tonight, God. lifted in this atmosphere one thing I love when the Lord comes into a place is that so many things change so many things turn around and I love what this song says because this song says when the Lord is in a place dry bones must awaken when the Lord is in a place dry bones things that are dead things that are dried up they have no choice but to come back to life. And I love what this song says because it says that when the Lord steps into a place, not only do dry bones awaken, but chains break as well. Oh, I don't know if you're here in this room tonight, but the Lord said every single dry area in your life, after this weekend, that dry area is about to receive the life of the Holy Spirit. I'm just waiting to see where the church is. I, I'm just waiting. I don't know if this side is ready. I don't know. I don't know if this side. I don't know if that side is ready. But the Lord says he's about to bring that thing back to life. God said he's about to bring dead things back to life. Would you touch your neighbor and say, that dead thing is coming back to life. That One more time, tell them, say, that dead thing is coming back to life. And look at what the Bible says. I want you guys just to understand this. Put up, put up on the screen for me, Zephaniah chapter 3, as you're standing, because you're about to shout in about 30 seconds. So... This conference has been themed Daughters of Zion. And uh, yeah, you can, you can appreciate God for that. And look at what the Bible says about Daughters of Zion. Let's go to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. And I want you to, to, to jump in when I tell you to. Are we together? So the Bible says, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. When you come into this space, you have to understand that this is not a place for you to get quiet on God, but this is the space for the daughters of Zion. It's the space for the daughters of Zion to begin to sing and rejoice and shout and scream and run and jump and come on somebody daughter of Zion daughter of Zion daughter of Zion is this Even finish my text yet. It says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. It says, Be glad. Listen, if you came in here with a frown on your face, can I tell you something that the joy of the Lord is in this room right now? And you have no choice but to be glad. And look, it says, Daughter of Zion. Rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. I want you to jump in with me on verse 15. One, two, three, and go. Read it. It says, the Lord. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't read it too fast now. You're about to miss the promise. It says, the Lord has taken away your shame. The Lord has taken away your pain the Lord has taken away your disgrace the Lord has taken away your judgment 
it doesn't matter what your mom said about you, what your friend said about you, when the king of glory is in the room, he says, I'm taking away. I'm taking away. Touch your name and say, your name is changing. Your, your name is changing. Your, your, your name is changing. If they called you poor, God says you're rich. If they say that you're anxious, tell them, God says I should be anxious for nothing. Says he has cast out your enemy. I prophesy over you. Every enemy, every person, who is your enemy, who is your opposition, who is your op, who don't like you, God says this weekend, he's taking them away. He's taking them away. He's taking, he's taking them away. He's taking them away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 that, that, that generational curse. That, that seems to find you in the nighttime, that, that, that tries to come against your peace. Yeah, that, that thing that, that holds you down when you're trying to get up, that, that sleep paralysis. The Lord says that I'm casting that thing out this way. Read this with me. The third, the fourth line, it says the king of Israel, one, two, three, and go. The king. Hey, be 
before I invite up the woman of God, I want you to fight your battles real quick with a praise. And you're about to, you're about to jump, scream and shout. Because let me tell you something, that your praise is a weapon. And, 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 and when you've come into this atmosphere, you can't look cute just because all the girlies are here. But when you come before the king, he responds to praise. So real quick, we're going to get the band to help us. But I want you to give God a 30 second praise and let the enemy know that this weekend, don't try me. This weekend, don't try me. This weekend, don't try me. It was all this town. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight. How I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Come on, don't stop. Just praise for your sister that's standing beside you. But that wasn't for the king. Because if it was for the king, there would be some ladies that would be running all around this place. I like it. I like it. I like it. Come on! Say this is how city of Ottawa. None of this would be able to be possible without our general overseer, Dr. Ralph Dart and Mama Regina. We love you. We appreciate you. Big shout out to Pastor Kofi and the entire Bridge Leadership fam. Sis, I'm so honored that you would come from California to be with us today. And so without any further ado, 
for the very first time in Ottawa and in Canada, help me welcome the ministry of Minister Emmy Moore. Come on. tonight is for a divine purpose and a divine appointment for God to encounter your heart tonight. Jesus. I don't know if you came in here with chains as your accessories, but we're chopping those off today. Amen. And this is one of those days to where you look back on your journey by God and you're saying, he rescued me, he freed me. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care if you're in the pit, if you're at the peak of the palace. God is here and he is going to move in such a way that is so powerful and so beautiful. We are going to encounter his power by his blood and his intimacy because he loves you, Jesus. tell you why I'm so excited. I'm so excited because I feel his presence from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Absolutely feel it. God is in this room. Do you, do you understand that? You're encountering the presence of God. How miraculous. We used to have to go in the Old Testament tent of meetings or you have to go to a place to encounter the presence, but we get to encounter him right now. We are living in a miracle because of his son. Jesus, we thank you, we thank you. You guys could go ahead and find your seats because I'm not going to cap, I'm sweating. <laughs> the turtleneck was not appropriate for today, but it is what it is. Oh, thank you. Oh, man. Jesus is so good. Jesus is so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So... A number of things are going to happen today, and I'm very blessed that this room has already picked it up, that the Spirit of the Lord is near. And not only are you guys daughters, but you're champions. God is wanting to bring his power tonight. And as I was in prayer and I was just discerning what the Lord was wanting me to talk about, I could come on here and say a million things. And the Lord told me, he said, Emmy, I want you to tell my daughters, not that just they're my kids, but that they're destined to win. You are. You are. And I want to come against every doubt, every fear, every lie. The enemy has told you that you are not going to win the race, that you do not have the tools, that you are not strong enough, that the cross wasn't enough. It was. Yes. So... Today is going to be such a special day because we're going to talk about the author and the finisher, the man we fix our eyes on each and every single day, the love of my absolute life who rescued me. Oh, man, I didn't even plan on sharing my story, but I just feel the Lord urging me. I was depressed, suicidal, anxious, 
tied to addiction, abused by my family. Um, and I never would have thought that I would be here today. Uh, Lord, just, Jesus. I could just weep. One thing about me, I'm a little baby. I will cry over the presence of the Lord because when I thought that I wasn't heard, seen, and loved, he reminded me that I was. He reminded me that he called me out by name, that I am loved, I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm not forsaken, that I have a God who goes to war for me. I have a God who stripped himself from glory to endure shame on my behalf. This is the gospel. This is fundamental basic. <laughs> and it's as if sometimes we forget this. And um, before I start, I first want to honor a few people first. Please give it up for Prophet Ralph. Please stand up for him. You are man of God who is worthy of honor. The way you have pastored and shepherded this church is admirable. You are changing a, a generation because of your obedience. And on the behalf of the sisters, we thank you, and we love you so much, and we love how the Lord shines through you. So we just want to honor you, so thank you. Thank you. No, this church is absolutely amazing. Oh, my goodness. I was, oh, that's so good. I also want to honor my mentors who couldn't make it, which is Apostle and Prophetess Brookings. They have poured into me like no other. They have just grew my heart in such a way to where it's just full of so much love and also wisdom and power at the same time. So I want to honor my team back home. And then also, I mean, who wrote it? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Pastor Malik. I'm not going to talk about you too much. You're great. Love you. Um, I'm so He's here uh, supporting me and just... Um, because I'm going to be transparent. This is my first time doing something like this. I usually have thousands of people listening. Thank you, Jesus. I usually have so many people listening to me behind a screen, never in a live audience. So I'm just blessed that the Lord has brought me here. And we all get to, yes, we all get to touch and agree with his goodness. So I'm excited today. Um, so, yeah, you guys can take a seat. We're going to talk about the word of God today and how good he is. So, pretty simple. Today I'm wanting to talk about Jesus and how when we fix our eyes on him, it's forever bring nourishment onto our souls. And the thing that me and you have in common is not only that we're women, but when we confessed our yes to Christ, we have been simultaneously enlisted into a race. A race that we don't know how to run at times. It may seem scary or dark. I don't know if you came in here with something and you're like, I'm going through the motions. I'm being obedient to God. And yet I keep coming across anxiety. I keep coming across depression, people who do not feel that void in my heart, whether if it's abuse, whether if it's some sort of addiction from drugs or from alcohol or not even that, just having an addictive personality, whatever it may be. I don't know what your struggle is when you walked in. But I'm just going to spoil the message real quick. Jesus is your answer. And we're going to talk about why that is. And I think what's so funny is I feel like this is a joke we say in Christianity a lot is, man, I feel like when I said yes, my life just got way harder. <laughs> like I just feel like everything got way bigger. And it's not because our lives weren't hard in the first place. It's because God has so graciously removed the blindfold of the dominion of darkness, the hands that were over our eyes, and now we see everything for what it is. It's just a matter of learning how to navigate it. And the Lord wanted to educate his daughters today. He wanted to have a daddy-daughter talk. Because I, when I think of the Lord, it's so easy for me to see him as a king. And I'm going to show you the part of God that I love the most, that he loves to sit, that he loves to talk and speak with you. And most of all, he likes to share with you. And what he loves to share most is his son and his love and his glory. So the Lord has instructed us to run the race we may not know how to run, with most importantly looking to him as our reward. 
I'm first going to be reading from Hebrews 12. So if you have your physical Bibles or on your phone, you could turn there. And I know if you've been to church for a long time and you're super saved, this is a scripture you're familiar with. But we're going to dissect this and see how the Lord is guiding us how to run the race, how we should be trained as his daughters. So when you're there, please say, I'm there. I'm there. Cool. Starting in verse 1, we're going to go to verse 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured on the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And, you have, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son endure hardship as discipline god is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline then you are not legitimate not true sons or daughters at all moreover we have ha had all human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it how much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live they disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for your name. We thank you for this divine encounter that you are here in this room, that we get to have the honor and the privilege to see your face, to be in the presence of your glory. God, I just decree and declare in this room that we are coming to hear this message with open hearts, open minds, and open hearts. And we just ask God. It says, ask and it shall be given into you. We, should, we are asking you, God, that you just fill our needs, that we see your face, that this is a time of intimacy. This is your stage, not mine. This is your message, not mine. This is yours. This is yours. I give you this message. God, I just humble myself before you. Use me as a vessel to spread your goodness so that your daughters may hear the truth that you have promised. Thank you, Jesus. I just ask for deliverance to happen during this message. Even if it's not a loud manifestation, but something in our hearts get delivered, God. Just ask that, Father God, as we're diving into your word, you touch us in such an intimate way that we feel your closeness. We understand your holiness. And most of all, the instruction that you give us how to run the race will forever seep down to the bottom of our hearts. Give us courage. Give us joy. Give us liberty. Give us peace. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I cast down every distraction that may come in the way of hearing the thing that your daughters are meant to hear. And I'll send them to the pits of hell in the abyss, and they shall wait for the day of judgment and not come back. That this is a distraction-free zone that we will not look. We just want to keep our eyes on you. We will not look away. We seal this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God's so good. Uh, so, like how I said, when you confess your yes, God simultaneously enlists you into a race. Everybody say race. Race is the ancient Greek word for agona, which is a famous word of Paul's, and it means struggles and conflicts of many kinds. And that actually makes a lot of sense now that I read it because I will be the first to testify that since I confess my yes, my race has been filled with struggles and conflicts. And Hebrews 12 gives us a beautiful picture of how to run the race in, in detailed order of how we could do the things of God and most of all win the prize, which is him. 
And I just want to encourage you guys today to do what you are made to do. Each and every single one of you guys in here has something that God has placed with inside of you that no one else can do. Run your race. You have purpose. If you have a pulse, you have purpose. If you have breath in your lungs, that means that God is not finished with you. There is purpose. There is something God is wanting to do with your life. So first, we need to touch and agree with that, that God is so good and he loves me so much that I'm still walking here, that I'm even on this stage, that you are in this very sea because he has called you to a divine purpose. Can I get an amen? God has called his daughters. And I first want to affirm that over you guys, that God has a purpose. So as we're running the race, that's a part of our purpose. It's our assignment. And I don't know what your race is, what your struggle, what your conflict is, but God's telling you to run it. Run your race. I don't know what's ahead of you. I don't know what's beside you. You must run to receive the things of God. You must. Hebrews 12 gives us a pretty clear picture of what this race looks like. One of the first things it says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses for us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, that we must be disciplined and that we're called to run. We're called to run. We're called to do the things of God. And I want to lay out what the race is because today is going to be a beautiful message because God's going to give you the cheat code of how to run your race. And I just want to talk about why this is so important real quick. This is fundamental. This is something you need to know every single day of your walk. Because I wake up, it's another day of the race. It's another day of me running. And sometimes we forget that we're running the race and we'll turn our mind and attention to our current circumstances, our problems, whatever it may be. But God is telling us to be in a posture to remember that we have purpose and God wants us to run the race. You have to wake up knowing that you're in it. That you're in it. You're in a real race, and we're going to lay this out, that there is a real crowd, there is real competitors, there is a real coach, there is a real prize, and there's a real daddy that's cheering you on. This is real. And when Paul says that we're called to run the race, he's not insisting that we all run the Olympics, but he's saying that there's a real spiritual race that we're all called to run each and every single day. So Hebrews 12 opens up giving out the full layout of what this looks like. So I'm just going to give some context. It opens up saying we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? A great cloud of witnesses refers to the people in the faith who are speculating. So I learn best when I think and when I imagine, when I just close my eyes and I can see. That's how I've always been trained. So when it comes to running the race and what the stadium and what the race looks like, I just want you to imagine the stadium, the track. The stadium is filled with a great cloud of witnesses. Who is that? It's not your brothers and sisters. That's the first thing I'm going to, or sorry, excuse me. The, the people in the crowd is your brothers and sisters. Your competitors are not your brothers and sisters. Because I think sometimes we run the race thinking that we're running against flesh and blood. But our competitors and the people we are running against is not our enemies. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not my enemy. Look at the other way and say, you are not my enemy. So who's the great cloud of witnesses is everyone you see in this room, cheering on, edifying, encouraged, encouraging your run, your race. And I think a lot of the times we have this false perception, and I do think it's an attack from Satan, (laughs) that it's our brothers and sisters we're running against. But scripture says that run in such a way so only one gets the prize. So that wouldn't make sense because when Jesus died on that cross, he died so all of us could win. So that doesn't mean I'm running against my brothers and sisters, meaning that my calling is not your calling, your calling is not mine, that I can't try to outrun you because we're not even competing against one another. We're all in our own lane. And I just want to kill the spirit of comparison real quick because I know this is a huge spirit that just tries to attack, especially daughters is that we're surrounded by a beautiful, gifted young woman. This is factual and this is evident. And I think where perversion can slip in is that there's this ideology that we're against one another. I just want to proclaim the spirit of unity of God's daughters and just claim that we are not each other's enemies. And I will be the first to say as a sister, everybody in this room, I'm saying this to your heart. I want to see you win. I want to see you win. 
And if I can say that, how much more can God say that? God wants to see you win. Your competitors is not flesh and blood. You are surrounded by your brothers and sisters, and they are edifying and encouraging your walk, but they're not your enemy. So let's set the tone real quick. So a great cloud of witnesses is your brothers and sisters surrounding you, speculating, cheering you on. Run your race. And the verse one also commit, or sorry, we run the race by fixing our eyes on Jesus, right? Verse one also tells us to throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. I'm gonna give you a story time real quick. So when I was in high school, I ran track, but don't ask me if I was good. I was just in it. Um, I just didn't want to go home. I had fun. All my friends were in track. It was kind of easy. So I was like, okay, let's just do it. I love track. Um, like I said, wasn't the best at it, but I love hanging out with friends and I love being a part of something, being a part of a team. And everything was great. There was just one thing I just really didn't like about track. And even to this day, this is something that I was not a fan of. So as you can see, or if you know me personally, I love wearing baggy clothes. I've always just been like that. I just like wearing big things. I like being swallowed by my pants and my jacket. Um, and that's because I've always been slim and thin, it, like since the womb. I'm tall and built like an extension cord. It's always been like that. And <laughs> when, especially in high school and your body's like growing weird and it's kind of like, oh, I'm still tall and slender, what's going on? And I, I would always wear just baggy clothes. That's just always how I've been. So when it came to going to track practice or let alone running meets, we had to run with these tight tank tops, these tiny spandex or leggings. And girl, I was like, ooh, this is the real me. You are seeing everything. You are seeing my legs, my everything, and it's because I was so insecure, but that was just high school stuff. But as the reason as to why I bring that up is because there's something so important as to why you have to run with the right attire. Even though I hated not wearing baggy clothes, it was essential that I had to run my race and I had to do the thing that I was called to do with shorts and a tank top and leggings because if I wore anything more than that, it would break up my speed. And when it says, in verse 1 of Hebrews 12, to throw off everything that throws you into hindrance. Some of us are wearing hoodies of bondage. Some, some of us are wearing sweatpants of anxiety. And some of us are trying to run a race with a suitcase of baby mama drama, with anxiety, with depression, with, oh, this girl said that, oh, my man did this. When you're supposed to run the race with all these things off. So I just want to set the tone of what it looks like at the starting line. Because we're so focused on the assignment to run, we forgot what, it, what it's like to even just be prepared for the thing we're about to run towards. So be in the right attire, throw off everything, every hindrance. What baggage do you have that you're trying to run with? Because God is not going to bless the thing that is going to throw you into iniquity. That's just how it is. What are you trying to bring with you that you can't? Leave it behind. And the next part of that says the sin that so easily entangles. Other translations say sin that so easily trips us over. So when I think of that, I think of my shoes. Whenever I ran track, even though I wasn't good at it, I had special shoes. I had track shoes. And they were special because they were designed for me to run the race. And I would easily trip over the thing that God had destined me to run towards if my shoes were untied, if I failed to look down and look at my feet. Some of us are too scared to even look down at our feet and we're trying to run the race tripping over it. Fix your shoes, tie your laces. The sin that so easily entangles could be avoided if we just tie it, if we just bind it. So when you're at the starting line, are you in the right position? Are you prepared? Are you throwing off everything that could throw you into hindrance? Are you tying up the bondage, the sin? Are you repenting? What does that look like to be at the starting line? Verse 1 also commands us to run the race with perseverance as the track is marked out for us. What does it mean to persevere? To persevere means to continue in a course of action, even in the face of adversity, with little or no prospect of success. So this is exactly what Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 exercises, right? I mean, not on my own understanding. Trust in the Lord, and he will make my path straight. Perseverance is running the race in faith, because we walk by faith and not by sight. It's running the race knowing that what? That it's marked out before me? 
Do you understand what that means? That means the places that you haven't been yet, God's footsteps are already in it. It's already there. It's already before me. So run with perseverance. Why? Because his footsteps are already there. You have evidence in the track. So when I'm at the starting line and I'm about to run, I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, my brothers and sisters cheering me on. I'm in the right attire, throwing off everything, all the sin that could easily be entangled, everything that throws me into hindrance, and knowing that the track is marked out before me, knowing I need to persevere. I want to do something great because I feel like sometimes we save the good news at, at the end for sermons sometimes. I want to deliver it first. And what that good news is, is that the same God that enlisted us into the race is not only our coach, but is more importantly our trophy. Jesus is our prize. And I want to communicate that the race that we're running is not a race that we're running alone. What's been said all night was absolutely prophetic and in the spirit. Emmanuel, God, who is with us. I'm not running this race alone. He is at the finish line. He is my he is my prize. He is my coach. He is my everything. And I'm not running this alone. The, the race, the track that's marked out before me, he's been there. He's with me. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. God is everywhere all at once because he loves me. Do you understand how intimate and beautiful that is? Like, just sit with that. And I want to talk about the victory on the, this very day that by his stripes we are healed. When the son of man was mocked and beaten, he wore a crown that, and he endured shame and was stripped of glory so we could have eternal life with him. And that fear and uncertainty of death has been conquered by his resurrection power. This is our prize. Our prize is a God who humbled himself before us so he can inherit us. That we, A verse that's been messing me up is Ephesians 1.18. It is so beautiful. It says how we are God's most righteous, most beautiful, most glorious inheritance. I'm God's inheritance? Do you understand what that means? That God looks at us and he is pleased and he loves us so much. And just know that God wants to see you win. He wants to see you finish this race. And I know that because he died on the cross for you. That's enough proof in the pudding. That's what it is. He wants to see you win so bad that he sent his one and only son to die the death that you wouldn't have to die. He paid the price. Verse two says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, which is the answer to all things. Whatever you walked in here with, your answer is to fix your eyes on Jesus. And please hear me, if we're being very for real, some of us are running the race with little faith and confusion because we keep refusing to look at him at the finish line. And I have a question. Who do you have your eyes fixed on? Who do you have your eyes fixed on? Simply fix your eyes on Jesus. And I think a lot of you guys were hoping that I would stand up here and give you a solution of how to stop sinning, how to stop doing this one thing that just keeps going over and over and over. But your answer is to pursue his face, to lock eyes with him. And I think sometimes we try to avoid so much that we're giving <laughs> the thing we're supposed to avoid way too much attention than the actual person we're supposed to pursue. Matthew 6, 30, 33 does not say, but first seek the sin that you must avoid. It says what? But first... Seek his kingdom and what? His righteousness and all things shall be given to you. That's what you need. There's a difference between avoiding sin and pursuing Jesus. There's a difference. And I think a lot of people think that they're pursuing God by avoiding their problems. Your prize isn't the avoidance of sin. Your prize is Jesus. It's different. It's different. And I think we're trying to run the race, trying to run away from something, trying to get away from this addiction, this abusement, whatever it may be, when the prize is Jesus. It's not the absence of your problems that comes with it. That's not your ultimate prize. Your prize is a man. It's your father. That is your prize. That there is a God in heaven who leaps for joy when he sees your face. Because if the answer or the prize that we were supposed to win was the absence of our problems, then what would be the purpose as to why we live and breathe? 
We're made for intimacy. We're made for intimacy with Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Earlier we talked about how our brothers and sisters are not our competitors. Oh, I'm so excited for this. <laughs> I'm so excited for this one. Our competitors is not against flesh and blood, but it's exactly what Ephesians 6 says. Our competitors are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Your competitors are demonic devices trained by the enemy to take you out of your race. You're at the starting line. I remember when I would play sports, I remember people just badmouth one another. Your competitors are trying to badmouth you out of your race. You are at the starting line fixing your eyes on Jesus and you got lust right next to you trying to chew you out. And you got addiction next to you trying to tell you that you're not going to make it. You got the spirit of comparison telling you that you're not good enough. You got the spirit of fear telling you that you're never going to make it and that there's not going to be a victory. These are all demonic devices trained by the enemy to take you out. That's what it is. Our competitors is not flesh and blood. Our competitors is the enemy. But good news again, these competitors are destined to lose. Run in such a way to where only one gets the prize. And that prize and that victory belongs to you. It belongs to you. The victory that we get to touch and agree with with Christ belongs to his children. Not these demonic devices and these demons trying to run against me. They are destined to lose. They are screaming in the pits of hell as we speak. They're done. They're cooked. They're done. And I think it's delusional that we think Satan is going to win. He already lost. I want to come against every single lie that the enemy has told you that you are not going to win your battle. I'm going to come against every single fear in the mighty name of Jesus that you're not going to break that generational curse. I come against every spiritual lie and deception that the, that the enemy is trying to tell you that you won't make it, that you're not enough, that you're not strong enough. Because with Jesus, by his strength, my daughters, you are. Here's the thing. The enemy is just loud. He's just loud because he's so mad he lost. Such a loser. <laughs> you talking so loud because you're mad that you lost. You talking so loud because you know I'm going to beat this generational curse. You talking so loud because you know that the Lord is my victor. You, you're talking so loud because you're mad that you are destined to lie in the abyss. Do you understand that the reason as to why Satan is so loud is because he's so mad? He's so mad because you touch and agree with God's goodness. And he's mad because you're no longer his companion. You're a threat now. And girlies, he's scared of y'all. The Bible says that we are the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. And that we have the authority to tread upon scorpions and serpents. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. <laughs> Nothing. Financial, emotional, spiritual, physical, organizational relational, whatever it may be, it shall not prosper. Because why? The enemy is a liar! He's a liar! He's a liar! Jesus. When we face intimidation, we often get so focused on how to avoid Satan and the demonic, when the answer is just keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's what it is. And we must not be intimidated by these devices because exactly what Colossians 1.13 says is that Christ has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. Do you believe that? Jesus, yes. We believe he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And some of you guys are having a hard time running a race because you're too intimidated by competitors that are destined to lose. They're not going to outrun you. They can't. They can't. I'm going to show you what avoiding sin looks like versus pursuing Jesus. Like how I said, I'm a visual person. So when God gave me this visionary, I thought of a track, right? We're smack in the middle. I'm looking straight, straight there. There's Jesus. There's my prize. I love you so much. And I have the spirit of whatever it may be, lust next to me, anxiety, depression, addiction, confusion, anxiety, fear, all these things that are trying to run against me, right? This is what avoiding sin looks like. Oh my God. 
Stop, stop, shh, shh, be quiet, be quiet, stop. No, no, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win. Wait, no, stop, stop, stop. You're, you're not even looking on the prize. And let me say this, there is a time where we're supposed to look at these things dead in the face and say that you have no room <laughs> and you have no authority or account to come and dictate my life and the way and the purpose that God has put on my heart. There's times to look at things for what they are, but not to give it your attention. Because if the enemy has the ability to distract you, he has the ability to destroy you. And sometimes the enemy will send things to be super loud so we could change our perspective. And the title of tonight's message is to fix your eyes. What do you have your eyes fixed on? Who are you looking at? I want to tell you something that's so beautiful. How I said, looking straight forward on our eyes on the prize. What God has blessed all of us with, if you have the ability and gracious gift to see, like the majority of people, there is something very cool. So whenever I look straight forward, I'm still able to look at everybody over here. Meaning what? That when I'm running my waist, I'm able to keep my eyes on the prize. But if anything tries to come up at me, any of these competitors that are trying to pull a slick one, I'm able to see it because of what? Peripheral vision. Why are we turning our bodies toward things that don't need all of us? The enemy wants to distract you because he wants to destroy you. That's it. That's his will. That's his assignment. We must fix our eyes. We must turn our posture towards Jesus. We must look him in the face and know that he is the author and the finisher, that he is our prize, that he is our most beautiful, beautiful father. And I want to tell you another thing that scripture also does not say. Scripture does not say to pursue your purpose above God's presence. And I want to give you Bible for that. When your answer, your answer to stop sinning is to pursue more of Jesus, right? And your assignment is to run. But the prize is Jesus. We have to be more infatuated with Jesus more with our assi than, more than our assignment to run. Some of us are, get, are so caught up in our purpose and what we have to do that we forget who we're doing it for. I want to give you Bible. So Sarai... Her and Abram, God gave Sarai a promise that she was going to have a son who was going to be, her, the lineage was going to be compared to the stars in the sky. And Sarah was so fixed on this promise that the very thing that God promised in her belly, she put it on an altar and worshipped it. And that's how we get Hagar and Ishmael. And because of that, she put the promise above God's presence. How many of us do that with other things? How many of us do that with our purpose, with our assignment to run? The assignment is to run, but the prize is Jesus. Let us run the race infatuated with the prize, excited to get it. I think of anyone who runs a race or is in a competition or if you're, if you're in a sport, you're excited to get the trophy. You're excited to win. The race is just to get to the prize. Let's be infatuated by the prize. Let's be infatuated with the face of Jesus. Run because you want him. Psalms 105 says, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. His faithfulness continues through all generations. My God is the prize. He is my everything. He is my El Shaddai. He is the most high. He is Rapha. He is Jehovah Jireh. My God, who is my prize, loves me. And he's jumping up and down, wanting me to win and to run and to seek his face. And how selfish of us that we look away at times. Our God is excited for us. He is so excited for us to win the prize. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. This is one of my favorite things that Hebrews 12 says. The next part of Hebrews 12 says that he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Why is that important? A pioneer is a first person to explore or discover a new re region or area. So when it says that Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, exactly what it said earlier, that the track is marked out for you. That he has already discovered the season, the place, the time, the tribulation that you're about to step in. If you're in a new season and you're like, God, I'm so scared. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to make it to the end. I don't know how I'm going to conquer this. I don't know how I'm going to go past this. It says that he is the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. He's been there. He's touched it. He's there with you as you speak. The perfecter of our, of our faith. So when I follow his footsteps, he perfects it. 
Psalms 39 or 37, 23 says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. Our trophy, which is Jesus, has given us the blueprints of the race we are running. We are without excuse. We are without excuse. We have a blueprint. The race that we're running comes with a cheat code. And he gives it so graciously to us. We just have to touch and agree and be obedient to it. And I want to encourage each and every single one of you guys here today to not give up on your season that God has called you to just because you don't recognize it. He is the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. He has been there. He has touched it. And God is calling you higher. When I think of a race, I think of the story of Joshua. And funny enough, I was going through a really hard time at the end of last year. Just a lot of things just started hitting me in my dome. And I was having a hard time mentally and psychologically just having a hard time navigating just me and what God was wanting to do through my life and just hitting things one after another. And when you go through those fiery seasons, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'll hype myself up with scripture all day. Like, yeah, I'm ahead and I tell I'm above and not beneath. Yeah, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I would just like hype myself up all day because that's what keeps my spirits up. It's just the word. And I was cleaning my office one day and I just heard, be strong and courageous. And I was like, was that me or was that God? Because sometimes <laughs> God will tell me something. I'm like, was that me? And then I asked him, I was like, God, was that you? And then he said nothing. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go home and read Joshua 1. And I'm going to tell you guys the same thing that God told me. And how ever since God spoke to me to be strong and courageous, I've been able to train for the race effectively. So we're going to be reading Joshua 1, 5 through 9. And just context really quick. So what's happening in Joshua chapter 1 is that Moses couldn't carry out the thing that God told him to do because of one act of disobedience. Let this be a reminder. Don't let one thing disqualify you. Moses was called to lead the Israelites into the promised land. And because of one dis act of disobedience, he was disqualified. It's kind of like a relay race where you pass the baton. Moses had to pass the baton on to Joshua. And Joshua had to finish the race. And Joshua, this was new for him <laughs> because that was Moses' job. <laughs> and Joshua is like, man, now I'm having to carry out the thing that Moses was supposed to do, but the Lord comes in such a beautiful way to encourage him. And that's where we find ourselves in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. And this is God speaking to him. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may, not, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The first chapter of Joshua is the instruction manual of how to run the race. And I just love how God kept assuring his presence over Joshua. God is making that same promise to you. You are walking into a new season. He is with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Daughters, he loves you. And let us be encouraged by this word that when God was speaking to Joshua, we could touch and agree with this ourselves because God gives Joshua the training manual and, and what he needs to do to win the race. And this is how we train. He gives Joshua these four commands to be strong and courageous, to not be afraid to meditate on the word day and night so you can walk in wisdom and to be obedient and not turn from it. How many of us are actually consistent with these four things? And I wonder how many of us would run the race in confidence, not letting the wind bother us if we stood strong and courageous, if we did not allow the spirit of fear to come against us, if we meditate on the word day and night and we obey the law and don't turn from it. And I wanna tell you the thing that shook my whole life and it's when God told me to be strong and courageous. And I don't know if I'm just like a little slow, but I realized as I was reading Joshua 1, 1 uh, 9, 
I realized I had no idea what it meant to be strong and courageous. I was like, is it because I don't have, I don't got my high school diploma, my, <laughs> my middle school diploma? I was like, did I miss this? Like, I, when I think of being strong, I got a brother that's 6'3", 17 years old, and my boy is jacked. When I think of someone who's strong, I think of him. So when I was thinking of someone strong, I was thinking of someone who, like, goes to the gym and just irons it out. Someone who is just standing strong and just strong. I didn't really know any more depths to that. And then when I thought of courageous, I didn't even know what the word courage meant. When I thought of courageous, I was thinking of, anyone see the Wizard of Oz? I was thinking of the, the lion who was like, I need courage. I was like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. And <laughs> Google is such a blessing because I looked up what it meant to be strong and courageous, and it absolutely changed my entire life. And this is the same thing that God is commanding you daughters to do as you're running the race, to be strong and courageous. So what does it mean to be strong? To be strong means to be able to withstand. Pause. What does it mean to withstand? To withstand means to remain unaffected or undamaged. That's the first part. So to be strong means to withstand, a.k.a. remain unaffected or undamaged by great forces of pressure. So when God is calling us to be strong, he's not saying that nothing's going to come. If anything, he says something great is going to come. A great pressure is going to try to come against you. But you must stand firm in me, remaining unaffected and undamaged by the great force of pressure that is trying to take you out. Jesus, that is so good. You're calling me to be strong like that? That's what your strength looks like? That I get to remain unaffected and undamaged by great forces of pressure when I get to touch and agree with your strength? And then what it means to be courageous, and I love how God puts both of these together. The word courage is synonymous to the word brave. And what it means to be brave means to be ready to endure danger or pain. So when God is telling us to be strong and courageous, he's simultaneously saying, be ready. Be ready to endure danger or or pain, but you will remain unaffected and undamaged by these great forces of pressure. That is such a revelation. When I heard this, it just sparked my spirit. And the truth of the matter is, and that the race that we're running is filled with struggles and conflicts, but we're called to stand strong and courageous in the face of adversity. And there's a reason as to why God said it so many times to Joshua, be strong and courageous. He said it about four times. I believe it was in verses 5, 6, 7, and 18. He told Joshua, be strong and courageous four times. Why? He was encouraging Joshua to be bold. Be bold. Step into the things of God and remain unaffected and undamaged by great forces of pressure. How many of us are stepping into faith with boldness? Stepping into our race Boldness. God was encouraging his son to be bold. And daughters, God is encouraging you to be bold. Be bold. Be bold for God. Do not be ashamed. Be bold. Your circumstances may be hard, but God is so much bigger. He's so much bigger. And we know that to be strong and courageous is essential to training the good race. But how do we do that? Because I could tell you to be strong and courageous, but you're like, Emmy, I don't know how to do that. One word, trust. And I think that word triggers a lot of women <laughs> because a lot of us have had our trust robbed from us. We have been mistreated by people, whether if it's men, your father, your brother, your family, your friends, teachers at school. We've been abandoned, betrayed, and neglected. And you the biggest, one of the biggest trauma responses is trust issues. And God is telling us that when we trust in him, we are kept safe because we're able to stand strong and courageous in him when we trust in him. Psalms 28, 7 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy in my song. I praise him. You know that, that verse that every college athlete got tattooed on them, Philippians 4.13, is true. <laughs> it's true. For I can do everything through Christ who what? Who gives me strength. They ain't lie. They just not living it out. It's in your Instagram bio, but <laughs> I don't know why that's the verse. Is that like an initiation process? I don't know what that is. <laughs> but, but the verse is true. And God is encouraging Joshua to trust 
daughters, if you want to be strong and courageous, if you want to have faith that is unshakable, if you want to remain unaffected and undamaged by great forces of pressure, trust. That is your answer. You've got to let go of your trauma. You can't let your trauma triumph over your life. You can't let your circumstances get in the way of the victor you're supposed to touch and agree with. There is true deliverance we get to encounter when we put our trauma behind us and we triumph for the things of God. You have to trust. You have to. We have to trust because there's a real reality of us having a real enemy that has a real assignment. John 10, 10, the thief only comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Satan wants to steal and rob you from your own race. Satan wants to kill your calling and Satan wants to destroy the anointing on your life by sending you demons and competitors that are never destined to win. The enemy is tricky and we must be discerning. And I just wanna encourage this real quick. Prayer keeps you in victory mode. It keeps you in victory mode. It keeps you in that mentality of a champion. When you affirm the word of God over your life and you decree and declare his goodness, when you decree and declare the promises that he has over your life, you are standing in a victory. We have a real enemy, but a real enemy that is destined to lose. And we get to touch and agree with that victory when we step in prayer, when we step into the weapons that the Lord has given us and we get to use them. Galatians 5, 7 says, you were running a good race. Who cut you in on from obeying the truth? Are you allowing people to cut you in on your own race that you're destined to win? Jesus, I got to say it. If you're not praying and if you're not going to war in the spirit, you're giving a foothold for someone to cut you in on your own race. You have to fight. You just can't la di la di da yeah, you know, I love God, and he's just going to fight my battles without me doing anything. No, it doesn't work like that, because faith without works is what? Dead. It's dead. It's dead. You don't go to the, <laughs> like, you just can't go to the gym once a month and expect to have a six-pack. you got to keep going. you got to have faith. <laughs> got to have faith. I'm going to get the six-pack, and I'm going to get the six-pack so bad that I'm going to show up every single day at the gym so I could get the six-pack that I was promised. Same thing with your spiritual six-pack. You gotta show up each and every single day. You show up to the gym every day, you go on social media every day, you eat your favorite uh, pasta or whatever it may be each and every single day, but you won't pray? You won't pray? AKA, you won't talk to your dad? Uh-oh, your edges. You're not coming and talking to your dad? You have to speak to your father. You're ignoring your father when you're not, when you're not praying. It's not a genie wish. Father God, release me from this temptation. It's not a genie, it's your dad. Ask if, if he's really going to deliver you. Ask in faith because he's your father. We know this. Why are we praying as if we don't? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Every word in that is so special. Submit yourselves to who? To God. And then what? Because <laughs> people are trying to <laughs> resist the devil without submitting to God. You're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to resist something that, and you're not even submitted to the one who could rescue you. Resist the devil and he will what? He will flee. He will flee. He will leave. This is your answer. Make the Lord your coach. When you submit yourself to the Lord, then you are able to resist the devil and he will flee. And you can't resist something that you're keeping your eyes on. Fix your eyes on Jesus. We know our race, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, which is our brothers and sisters, that we're at the, finish, at the starting line, ready to run our race with the right attire. My shoes are tied. I'm wearing the right attire with the right mindset. I'm going to run with perseverance, knowing that the track is marked out before me, that my competitors are not flesh and blood, but it's demonic devices that are not going to win. They are destined to lose out of the prize right in front of me. And my prize is right in front of me. And guess who's hyping me up? My coach. My prize is also my coach. My trophy is also my trainer. I have a God that is fixing his eyes on me and wants to see me win so bad 
that he is also my trainer, my coach. He disciplines me. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus says, be rather blessed, or blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And that's Luke 11, 28. We are blessed to run the good race when we are being trained by his word, when we obey. And the Lord must be your ultimate coach, and you need to be trained. Because the whole reason as to why you need a trainer in the, perfect, in the first place, it might just be a character development course. And I think sometimes we'll have these afflictions and the trauma and the fire hit us. And we're like, God, deliver me. I don't know what's going on. I want to be out of it. God, rescue me. When God's saying, you don't need deliverance, you just need development. Maybe the answer to your season isn't that God is going to deliver you just like that. But God is going to give you deliverance through discipline because he wants to develop you. That's exactly what Hebrews 12 says, is that what good father doesn't discipline his children? Our God is also a trainer and a coach. And any person who has been in sports, any sort of activity who has been under the authority or under training of someone knows that the best combination of a good coach is anyone who encourages you and disciplines you equally. That's why it says in the word to just focus on Focus on him. Focus on his word. He's encouraging you through it. He's calling you to stay disciplined. Your process is necessary. Whatever you're going through right now, and God's not delivering you, maybe he just wants to develop you through it. Sometimes you have to smell the smoke so when the fire comes back, you know how to extinguish it. It's mercy that we go through the trials that we at times go through. But we have to be trained. We have to know how to fight with the sword of the spirit. We have to know the word of the Lord. We have to know how to obey it. We have to know the race that we're running. Because maybe you're not crazy. Maybe you just haven't been trained well. Maybe you just need to listen to the Lord as your coach. Let the Lord coach you. To run well, you have to show up to practice. And a lot of people are trying to play a game they never practiced for. you got to show up to practice. You're not going to win a championship if you're trying to run a race that you never practiced for. What does your practice look like? What does your secret space look like? What does your closet look like? Is God your coach? Are you allowing him to coach you? What does that look like? Are we giving God the, av the availability and the accessibility to coach us? Because he wants to coach you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants you to win the race so much that he's the prize and he's the coach. The next part of, of the four things that God said to Joshua to run the race well and how to train for it well, the first thing was to be strong and courageous, is what we just said, remain unaffected, undamaged by great forces of pressure. The second one is to not be afraid. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings up a snare, but whoever trusts in him puts his confidence in the Lord will be exalted and safe. I want to tell you something about fear really quick, because whether if we like to admit it or not, a lot of the things that throw us into corruption is usually out of the spirit of fear, but there's something so interesting about fear. Faith and fear are the only two things that demand for you to believe in something. What do I mean by that? You can't be faithful when you're fearful. You can't be fearful when you're faithful. It's the two things that demand for you to believe in something. Who are you believing in? Because when you believe in fear, you're believing in disbelief in God. They don't exist in the same place. It's two things that demand for you to believe in something. What are you choosing to believe? This is why the Lord is urging Joshua to not be afraid. He has to stay faithful. Why? Because Joshua is about to run a race, and the race is marked out before him. And he has to trust it. He has to walk and run in perseverance, following the footsteps that God has already made the impression in. It's just a matter of being obedient and following it through. And why do we have a hard time running the race? Because we don't believe that we're not worthy of running it. We don't believe that we'll win. We don't understand the value of the prize. This is all fear. Any doubt that's coming in to your mind is fear. It's fear. We must die to it. And I'm going to give you the remedy to that. Because I feel like I could be like, oh, don't fear. Don't be scared. This is the remedy. Exactly what 1 John 4.18 says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Are you made perfect in love? Beautiful, I love that answer. Are you made perfect in love? Because when I keep my eyes on the prize, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer in bondage or in chains by fear because I'm looking at the author and the finisher of this race. I'm looking at my prize. So when I keep my eyes on the prize and I fix my perspective and my gaze onto him, I have no reason to fear. I'm no reason to fear. And we have no reason to fear when Jesus has won the victory. Hebrews 12, end of verse 2. For the joy set before him, he endured on the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. Have you not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood? Consider him. Consider Jesus, Jesus, he endured such opposition so we will not grow weary and lose heart. There was a victory we touch and agree with when Jesus died on that cross. Are you agreeing with it? Do you agree with the victory? He is the remedy of fear. He is the embodiment of love. This is your answer. That, that tug that's in your heart, that hole that's deep inside of you and you don't know what it is, that's the Holy Spirit telling you that there is something better, that there is something bigger, that there is something that God is wanting to give you, that this is it. That this is it. That prize is eternal and that prize is not going to leave you. That void, that missing piece that you've had, the thing that you don't know how to conquer, the Lord is before you and he's ensuring, my daughter, come here. I just want you. I want your, I want your presence. You're my greatest, most glorious inheritance. I just see the Lord's face shining with a smile when he looks at your guys' faces. The Lord loves you. He loves you so much. Through Romans 5, 6 through 11, which is one of my favorite verses of all time. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. So for a good person, might someone possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, have you been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Our God is a God who sweat blood for us, who was shamed and humiliated for us, who served us and paid the price of ransom. Do you know what that means? That means <laughs> that we were held responsible for something. God had us in a chokehold because we messed up. We were agreeing to sin. We were in iniquity. And God sent his son so he could release us. And Jesus was the price of the ransom that we should have paid. And he did it because he's so good. And I want to encourage you guys with the prize, because what is the expectations of the prize, and what are the promises that God makes us? And I'm going to read these, and I really want you to believe them, and I want you to receive it, because at the finish line, this is your father, this is your victor, this is your champion, this is Jehovah Jireh, this is everything that you could ever ask for, and these are the promises he makes for us. And I'm going to read them, and I'm just going to ask Holy Spirit that you open the hearts of your daughters, that they get to receive your word that you have said, and it seeps down to the bottom of their hearts that they can see your goodness, that they, they encounter your face and your glory right now in this very moment. So I'm just going to read you some promises of the Lord and what the expectation of the prize is. It's kind of hefty, but it's so, it's so beautiful because this is what Jesus is telling us. Psalms 91, 14, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. Psalms 146, 8, the Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Proverbs 24, 16. For though the righteous seven, fall seven times, they will rise again. I will rise though I, oh wait, oh my gosh. 
dyslexia. <laughs> for, though, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Micah 7, 8. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for those, <laughs> the good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Matthew 28, 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Ephesians 3, 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasur immeasurably more than all that we ask for or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Isaiah 41 10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Philippians 1 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out onto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 19, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. This is what the prize promises us. Can we just give God glory for that? Thank you, Jesus, that you have promised us, that you love us, that there is riches at the end, that I'm gaining a prize that lasts for eternity, that when I fix my eyes onto you, I get a glimpse of you each and every single day that brings that refreshment and reverence to my soul. Jesus, how we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for this. And I want to go to the next part of Hebrews where, where it says, verse 5 through 6, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? This is what we just talked about. All these things, all these verses, all these Proverbs and Psalms, these are encouraging verses. These are declarations. These are all promises that the Lord has given us. And he's saying, have you forgotten the encouraging words that the Lord has spoken to his children? He said, my child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. I want to point out what the first phrase says. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten the what? The encouraging words the Lord gave you. Some of us have a hard time pushing forward and seeing the end of it because we forget the encouraging words that the Lord has given us. These things that I just said. All these Philippians, Psalms, and Proverbs, these are promises from the Lord of what the prize looks like at the end. And sometimes we have a hard time running because we forget. Remember, how do you remember? What the Lord instructed Joshua to meditate on the word day and night. Not once a week on Sunday or on small group days. Every day, day and night when I wake up, who am I giving attention to? Who am I giving my first fruits to? Before I go to sleep, what am I doing? Am I on TikTok? Am I on Instagram? Or am I giving my time to the Lord? How much time am I giving the Lord? How can I run my race for someone I, I don't even to or know or acknowledge you have to meditate on the word day and night that's how you know <laughs> you'll be running the race that you're destined to win because you're meditating on the word you're being refreshed with the word it's living and active it's sharp you have to read your word it's a necessity it's absolutely a necessity because why Jesus fought off Satan with scripture I think it would be such an L that Satan knows more scripture than you do you want to live like that? That my enemy knows more about my God than his child. Jesus fought off Satan in the garden with the word. And what's so funny is that Satan came against Jesus with what? The word. And he actually quoted Psalms 91. And what's so funny is that the part, and this is whenever Satan is, in, is trying to tell and tempt Jesus to jump off of the building or off of the cliff and your angels will catch you. What's so funny about that Psalm in 91, right after that verse, it says how the cobra will be defeated. <laughs> so it's so funny that the same verse that Satan tries to attack us with, his L comes right after it. <laughs> it comes right after it. But imagine if we didn't know our word and Satan tries to come towards us was with a perversion and we didn't know it enough that in that same verse he was squished he was done he lost 
know your word. You have a real enemy that is training to run against you and to disqualify you from your race. Don't let it happen. And you cannot let that happen by fixing your eyes on Jesus. That's it. How do you stay focused on running the race? You meditate on the word day and night. You stay obedient. You stay strong and courageous. You operate in the in power and love and a sound mind. That's exactly what 2 Timothy 1.7 says. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Don't operate out of the spirit of fear. Operate out of the spirit of love, the embodiment of love, which is Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They, dip, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach it to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Run with intention. And if you want to run fast, you've got to be trained well. If you want to win, you've got to be trained. If you want the prize, you have to show up to practice. If you want to win the game, you have to show up. The word is your training guide. And I want to do something really special just to close this off as we understand the race. The, the biggest thing that God wanted me to tell you guys was that he's the prize. And I think sometimes we just hear that and we're like, oh yeah, we know Jesus is the prize. And we know that the avoidance of our problems isn't the prize or that these things are trying to take us to all these things, but Jesus is the prize. Fixing our eyes onto him is the answer. And I want to exercise that. And I want to invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts and show us something. This is really spontaneous. I didn't plan to do this. This was just kind of like, okay, we're gonna do this. So I want you guys to close your eyes and put yourself in a position to receive from the Lord, to see his face. God, we are before you. Your daughters are here. We are confident in knowing that you are in this space. Jesus, that you love us. I'm going to give a moment for silence just for you to invite him. Invite him. Show us your glory. Show us your face. Show us your face. For Lord, you are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. Lord, you sustain the humble and cast wickedness to the ground. I thank you, Jesus, that you tell me in Romans 8, that what then shall we say in response to these things? That God, if you are for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither life nor death neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather heal Jesus. Heal yourself. I want each and every single one of you to ask God a question right now. And I want you to ask him, what do you think of me? And just allow him to speak to you. Thank you for your compassionate heart to show us that you are here.
that you want to train us, that you want to coach us, that you want to prime us, you want to help me finish this, that you are Alpha and Omega, that you are so grand and so great, but yet you admire me. My daughter, you love me. You, every time a nail was hammered into her son's hands, you were thinking of our faces. You were thinking of me. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for being so graciously good above all things. We open our hearts to you to receive. Let this be an encounterment we have with you, Jesus. To as we run the race, we ask you to strengthen us. We give you permission to be our strength. We give you permission to be our coach. We give you access. Anything we have put on the altar that is not you, we wipe it off. We cancel it. You're the only thing we fix our eyes on. The Lord is pleased with this atmosphere because he's having a daddy-daughter moment. Some of you just need to hear that you're seen. That God sees you. His eyes are locking with yours. He sees your struggles. He sees your afflictions. He sees your pain. But he also sees your joy. He sees... Jesus, thank you, Jesus, that you celebrate with us when no one was around to celebrate us. But God, while your daughters were in a corner, in the dark, crying and afraid, that you came and lit up the dark place, that your presence illuminated all things. And when you reached out your hand and we touched it, we are enlisted into a race to where the prize is your eternal glory. God, I ask for those who have the ability to see that they see your beauty now in the mighty name of Jesus, that, that visions are given to your children, that they're able to see the beauty of God. God, show us your beauty. Show us why you are the prize, Father God. We ask for you to exercise intimacy. God, and you, Holy Spirit, take us back to the place where you first saw us where you met me. <laughs> or better than that, take me to the place where I first noticed you, that you were there all along. God, even when I was on the brink of suicide, when I was 17, you were in that room and you told me, this is not the answer, I'm the answer. And when I saw your face, Jesus, I understood my prize, the most glorious, most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Jesus is your face. And Jesus is saying the same thing back to you, daughter. You are the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You're beautiful. Jesus wants to tell you you're beautiful. 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 You are beautiful. He made you intentionally. The height that you have is the height that you're supposed to have. Whether if it's your skin color or your hairstyle, God admires all of it. He looks at you and he is admired by the beauty of his daughters. He is looking at his children filled with joy because he's looking at his children in awe of what he's created. You are God's masterpiece. And some of you tonight just need to be in a posture of knowing that God sees you, he hears you, and he finds you beautiful. He finds you beautiful. 
Thank you, Jesus, that the prize that we're supposed to win, <laughs> that we encounter, that prize finds us beautiful. Our prize thinks we're the prize. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your own words, in your own prayer, in this secret space, in this intimate space with God, this is so heavy on my heart. It says in the word, ask and you shall, you shall receive, seek and you shall find. Ask God something, knowing that he's going to reveal it to you. God is a father that answers his children. And he's saying, daughter, what is it that you want to know? He's going to answer it. What is it that you want to know, daughter? We serve a God who is gracious, who is almighty, and wants to empower you through his love. What is it that you want to know about him? What is it that you want to know God is going to answer your request? Jesus, we thank you for this moment of intimacy. We thank you that you love your daughters in such a way that is so powerful that you see us in every circumstance, that you are Emmanuel, God, who is with us in every circumstance. Even the times to where we thought you weren't with us, God, I just pray that you take us back to that moment and you show us where you were in that. The time where you thought you were alone, you were burdened, you were afflicted, that no one was going to help you, that no one was going to lift you up, that you weren't heard, seen, or loved. Whatever that moment was in your childhood when you were a little girl and you felt like no one heard you, no one loved you. Where is God in that? Because he is there. And he's saying, look at me. I'm here. Baby, I'm here. My girl, I'm here. You're not alone. You are never alone. You've been searching for something your whole life, and you finally found it. Thank you, Jesus, that I found the thing I've been looking for. Thank you, Jesus, that you are my prize. Just lock eyes with him. My sisters, if you've ever gone through a trial or a tribulation, if you're going through something right now, God is encouraging you to lock eyes with him. This gaze that you're feeling right now and people are having a real encounterment in this room. Don't forget this moment because when the fire comes back up, when the trial comes back up, when the insecurity comes back up, remember this gaze. Get into his presence. The word says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened and what I will give you rest. When I'm weary and burdened and I'm troubled by affliction, am I coming to you? God, we just declare that we will come to you. Every time I feel burdened or weary, I will make the deliberate decision to come to you. This gaze that we're experiencing right now, Father God, we are going to experience it again. Every time I sense affliction, Jesus, I will seek your face. Because like how we're supposed to keep our eyes on the prize, Jesus' eyes are never, <laughs> are never off of ours. It's so funny because every time you look back at Jesus, you'll notice he never took his eyes off of you. Even the times you looked away, he was still looking at you. a crazy encounter or any like just he wants your presence this is what God wants he just wants you to show up let this be a time to where you don't have to do anything except for rest in his presence when you find that rest and you win the race by locking eyes with him look how beautiful they are look at his face when he sees you filled with joy and compassion 
That is the God we serve. That is the Father we have. Sisters all around this room, the Lord is pleased with you. The Lord is pleased with you. There's something so special happening. For some of you, this is the first time you've seen God in a long time. This is the first time you've seen God's face in a while. He's saying, I'm here. Hey, I've never left. I've always been here. You don't have to do anything right now. Just, just focus on me for a second. I got this. I got this. My sisters, you, will, you were never meant to do all the heavy lifting. God's such a good father. He's saying, let me do. Come on. Let me just. Some of you need to give something really heavy to God right now. That you've been trying to lift on your own. first account of worship is in a band. It's Abraham and his son Isaac offering something to the Lord. And I believe we can exercise a great account of worship if we give something to the Lord. It's, some, it's on some of your guys' hearts tonight to give him something that he's been from you. I'm not sure what it is. I just, I feel the heaviness of it. God doesn't want you to leave with that. God doesn't want you to leave with that. It has to go right now. It has to go right now. It has to go it has to go. Little girl, give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. There is real healing in this room because we're giving something to God that only he could handle. Trust him that he's going to take care of it. You have a God that loves you and is going to take care of you. Take this, Jesus. Give it to him. I felt it. Someone did it right now. He says, thank you for giving that to me, my daughter. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. I have it covered. I have it covered. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are seen. And my love will pour onto you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Let that, let your blood, Jesus, pour upon us. Let your love just fill every hole in our hearts. Let this be a divine appointment we have with you, Jesus. Remind us of our testimony. Remind us as to why we're here. Remind us as to why you've called us to run the race. Encourage us with your word. The Bible says you are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I don't know what your situation is, what you're going through, the thing that you just let go of. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You have the ability to tear down and cast down every vain imagination, pretension, and anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ. Why? Because he has given us weapons that are not carnal, but they are mighty through him. You are able to conquer. God is saying, thank you, my daughter, for giving these things that you can never handle so you can step in victory, so you can run the race that you are destined to win. Some of you guys were trying to run that race with baggy clothes. God's saying, give it to me. And to the daughters who did, he says, thank you. God doesn't want you to run a race with weight, with baggage, or a suitcase of problems. He wants you to leave it in its rightful place. 
So God, all the things that we just sacrifice to you and the things that we let go, we separate ourselves from it in the mighty name of Jesus. We decree and declare that the things that we have separated ourselves from and came out of agreement with, that these things shall not return nor transfer, that they will be sent rightfully so where they belong, Father God that your goodness and your love will always be made known to me, Jesus. That your love, that your eyes, that your gaze will always be fixed on me as I rebuke and I renounce every lie, every deception, anything that is throwing me into corruption, every false burden and responsibility as I get rid of it, Jesus, I replace it with your love. I replace it with your goodness. I replace it with your word. I replace it with your promises. I replace it with your glory. I replace it with your victory, Jesus. That we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are more than conquerors through Christ. Daughter, you are a conqueror. This is a divine appointment here today, and it is mercy that you are here today because God wants to encourage you that one, he loves you so much, and two, that he loves you so much that it's time to let go of the things that didn't love you back. Thank you, Jesus, for this divine moment, this unexpected, spontaneous Holy Spirit moment that you're moving in your daughter's heart. Jesus, give your daughter's vision. Show them your beauty. Show them your glory. We give you the highest praise. We thank you, Jesus, that you give us the ability to see that you train my hands for war, my fingers for battle. That, God, you have won the victory for me. That, Jesus, that I'm able to do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That, Jesus, you love me so much that you came and died for the atonement of sins for me. We thank you, Jesus. We give you the highest praise. We dive deep into your presence. And let us never forget this moment that we're having with you. Let us never forget this light as if it's a, fre a, 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 a breath of fresh air that we're experiencing right now, intimacy. And the int intimacy that we're experiencing right now fuels the power of your daughters. He's saying, my daughter, you are a daughter of a king of a king, of a king. Your father is a king. Everything he has, you're bound for that inheritance. God wants to give you all things that he has. He is gracious. We thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, that you are Jehovah Jireh, that you are a God who so graciously gives, that you are a God who hears the requests of his daughters and gives it to us because you love us, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you answer our prayers, even if it's not even in the way that we imagine it to be, that you still answer in a way that is fruitful, that is under your will, that your will is always done and not ours, Father God, that you move in such a way of power, but more importantly, that you are the full embodiment of love. Your daddy, your God, your prize is a king. And you get to spend eternity with him. This moment you're experiencing right now is a glimpse of what you're going to get in heaven. It's a glimpse. And doesn't it feel so good? This is what a partial of the prize feels like. This is what the prize looks like. That joy that you're experiencing right now, that's a part of the prize. Stay in his presence. We can't put our purpose above the presence. We can't put our assignment over our infatuation with Jesus. this moment and I feel led because I didn't know how it was going to close out but I feel led to just let you guys sit in silence and ask the Lord to speak to you ask him just ask him
because he wants to give. I think sometimes we'll just be in church and we'll jump and we'll scream, which is all great, and we'll celebrate, but there's a beauty in stillness. And this is just by our spontaneous Holy Spirit. So we're going to be in the silence and listen to God's voice. Do you have permission to cry? No one's going to judge you here. If you need to get in a posture, you could get in it. Real father would look at me in the eye. You did it. When I needed to be loved and I was neglected and left for dirt, you loved me. You loved me. You stood by me. You cheered me on. You thought of me as beautiful. You wiped my tears. You were there. You were there. You were there. The most beautiful. My superhero. inheritance my dad my dad
to you. Oh, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Just sing to him. Tell him how beautiful he is. Tell him how beautiful. My closest friend, you are the most beautiful. My father who fixed his eyes on me while I thought I was left in the dirt and in the dark, you were there. We thank you, Jesus. We lift to you the highest praise in the most intimate way possible, Jesus, that this is a divine encounter you're having with your children, especially with your daughters, that you have showed your face, that you have showed your glory. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing the secrets of the Father, for revealing the nature of who God is, for moving in such a powerful way that you are our ultimate my guidance. You are the pioneer and perfecter of my faith.
our coach, but he is our trophy. We have a real prize, and he's looking at you saying, my daughter, you have won. You get to touch and taste the victory because you locked eyes with me. So we thank you, Jesus, for this divine appointment. We thank you for the fact and the matter that we locked our eyes with you, that you showed us your gaze, that you gave us the blueprints, the race that you are a trophy, that you are our coach, that you are our father who cheers us on. You give us the blueprint, you give us the tools, you give us the shoes to run it, you give us the apparel to step into as we're running the race. Everything is from you, Jesus. We give you all the power, all the glory, and all the praise. I lack nothing because I have you. I lack nothing because I have the Lord beside me, the greatest gift, the greatest prize, and I give you all of the praise. Let this be a moment of thanksgiving. Give your praise to the Lord. Lift up your own song and tell him how good he is, and we love you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and we seal this prayer. Amen. Just sing to him.
Can we sing that one more time over us? Sing it out, say, God, I'm present. God, I'm my... You are the Alpha. He's the beginning and the end. in it because we don't feel that God's also in this life that we're living. Sometimes we feel like we're running this race alone. But I love this song because it says that he is the alpha. He is the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's also in the middle. He's holding it all together. He's holding your life all together. He's holding it together. He's holding it together. Would you do me a favor? Would you place your hand on your heart? Precious Holy Spirit, we come to you today not knowing what our future holds, but we do know the one who holds it. Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit, because you're healing hearts tonight. Lord, you're mending broken hearts tonight. Lord, you're giving us the endurance to run this race. Father, may we not lose sight of the prize, lose sight of the finish line, but Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, tonight we fix our eyes on you. Every single part of us, God, fixes our eyes on you. Father, we just look to you tonight and we say, Lord, we invite you into our race. We invite you into our heart. We invite you into our home. We invite you into our life. Lord, help us tonight to do your will, not ours. Lord, let your will be done. Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done in Ottawa tonight, God. Let your will be done in Canada tonight, God. Let your will be done in North America tonight, God. Let your will be done in Gen Z tonight, God. Let your will be done in Millennials tonight, God. Let your will be done at TLC tonight, God. Let your will be done at Bridge Youth tonight, God. Let your will be done at Campus Rush tonight, God. Let your will be done in this place. Father, we say we give our lives to you. We give everything to you. And we pour it at your feet, God. We break our alabaster box. And we say, Lord, you can take our life. God, we will follow you from the beginning to the end. Because we know that you're holding it all together. Oh, God, we know that you're holding it all together. God, we decide tonight to run this race with perseverance, with endurance, because we know, God, because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and they're cheering us on tonight. They're saying, Reggie, don't stop. They're saying, Emily, don't stop. They're saying, David, don't stop. They're saying, Stephanie, don't stop. They're saying, Paul said, Says, Esther says, 
Deborah says, Rahab says, Mary says, don't stop, they're cheering us on. They're cheering us on right now. I want us to be honest tonight. I just feel this leading. You know that you know that you know that you needed to hear this word tonight because you literally were at the point of giving up. And you were almost at the point of, of giving up on the race, of saying, you know what, God, I'm so over this life. I'm so done with this. But you know that you have to push yourself to be here tonight because you had to hear this word. And as you even sat in this room, the presence of God just breathed over you. I want individuals who would be honest tonight and say, Pastor, I literally almost gave up, but I just need someone to stand with me and pray with me just to help me on my course. I want, if you're any of those people, and don't be shy, I want you just to meet me at this altar because I want to get some people to help pray with you and for you. I only want honest people in this place. You said, Pastor, I literally almost threw in the towel. I only want honest people here today. I, I almost. says that he's given you the faith to continue. He's giving you the faith to continue. some incredible leaders, whether you're from Campus Rush or what have you, and you're a leader, I want you to please come, and I want you to pray with our sisters here, just if you're on 101, or if you're a CR leader, and you know this, just, like, just come and pray with our sisters here, just for the next five minutes, I want you to stand with them, I want you to pray for them in the spirit of love. And then I'll finish and get our mother, Mama Regina, to come and give us a prayer to close out. So please, leaders, everybody, wherever you are, let's, let's just go and minister to the people of God. If you're in the crowd, I would love for you to be on your feet if you have the ability to do so. If you're in the crowd and you're sitting down, you've been sitting for the past two hours. Can you just please stand with our sisters here and pray for them as God is touching them? Come on, would you just begin to pray? Just pray for them.
to speak words of encouragement over them, begin to pray for them. God, would you help them? God, would you keep them? Come on, we're family in this room. There's so many people here. Can we just stand with them? Come on, I want everybody. Yes, Pastor Naomi, please come and help us. Come on, please help us. Everybody is touched. Let's make sure everybody is touched. Let's pray for people. Let's keep moving. Let's make sure everybody is touched. Make sure everybody is touched.
There's so many people here. We may not even have time to get to each one. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch their hearts, Lord. Lord, there's no distance in the spirit. Pray, Father God, touch their hearts, Holy Spirit. Touch their hearts, Holy Spirit. Help them, God. Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Everybody here, just to listen for a few seconds, just to listen, just to listen. The Holy Spirit is moving in such a mighty way. We could literally be here all night, but the Lord has so much more for us tomorrow, and I want us to be able to get enough rest so that we can come back. But I want you to know that tonight the process began. But by tomorrow night, the full process would be completed. And so if you didn't get hands laid on you tonight, I want you to make it a point to be here tomorrow morning. We start at 9 a.m. sharp. The Spirit of God is going to continue to move, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray over us one more time. Please help take Minister Emmy and um, the man of God, Malik, to the back. They can go, please. Yeah, help take him to the back. Can we just celebrate the gift of God? Minister Emmy, come on, can we celebrate her? What a gift. What a gift. Please, our team, let's take them to the back so that they can rest. Let's take them so they can rest, please. If you're here, can you grab your sister that you're beside? Can you grab them? And I want you to speak life over them and say, you will not die. All over this entire room, grab your sister beside you. Say, you will not die. Say it one more time. Say, you will not die. You will not quit, but you will finish. Say that one more time. Say, you will not die. You will not quit, but you will finish. Ooh, I feel God on that right there. God says you're going to finish the race. So as you hug your sister, I want you guys just to quickly go back to your seats. Ooh, yeah, you can hug it out. I mean, it's heavy in here. You can hug it out. You can love on Jesus together. Oh, my goodness. What a presence of God. Was anybody blessed tonight? No, if you believe it, if you know that your life has changed already, can you give God a praise from the inside? He's everywhere. He's right in this place. Dear April, night one is almost done. And I don't want you to, to run away right, right now, but we do have a couple more things before we're able to let you go out those doors. And the first is this. How many of you know that God delights when his daughters bring him sacrifice? God delights when his daughters come to him with their substance, come to him with an offering, with a tithe, with something that they can give to him. And at Bridge Youth, 
all my church, you already know, we don't play when it comes to giving time and offering time because that's where the blessing is. And so if today's your first time, I want you to understand this principle that coming to God empty-handed is a terrible thing to do. But God delights when his children come to him with gifts, with sacrifices, with offering to give unto him. And so tonight we're going to get into that period where we're able to give our first offering of Dear April 2024 unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so I want you, if you're ready, would you just place your hand up, stick your hand up, because I want our team to be able to give everybody who's giving an envelope. And you can see that the giving mechanisms here are on the screen. Uh, yeah, just keep your hands raised. There's hands all over. Ushers, can we please help quickly? There's hands everywhere. Please, there's hands everywhere. Let's in the front everywhere. Ushers, please, quickly, quickly, quickly. If you need an envelope, let's serve. Let's help the people of God. Please, there's hands everywhere. There's hands in the front who are serving this middle section here. Please, let's get everybody taken care of right here in this middle section. Anybody who needs an envelope, just keep your hand raised. And we want to give to God. We want to give to God. There's a hand right there at the back on the camera. Everybody, let's give to God. Let's give to God. We have two ways of giving. The first, of course, is via cash. The second is via e-transfer. So let's give our best to God. You'll leave here and you'll stop at McDonald's and get something for $20. You'll buy your wig for $500. How much do wigs cost? Is it 500? 350? Which one? No, I think the cheap, someone said 1,000. The Pastor Natasha said 1,000. But when it's time to give in the house of God, oh, what am I gonna, let me see what, what coins I can, listen, I want us to give to God a best gift, the best gift that we can possibly give to him. Because are we saying that our hair or food is more important than giving to God? Is that what we're saying? So tonight, I want to make sure that we are able to give our best offering to God. If you don't know that we take offering at Bridge, now that you, now you know, and um, you'll come better prepared tomorrow. But even if you want to ask your friend, please do so. Because the presence of God in this room is so rich that I don't want you to miss what God has for you. I want you to be able to lay something at the feet of Jesus tonight. And I want us to be able to give to him, all right? So let's give our best to God, all right? Let's give our best to God. Let's give our best to God. All right, if you're ready to give, would you please be upstanding on your feet? If you're ready to give, let's be upstanding on our feet ready to give, let's be upstanding on our feet. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. Would you just begin to pray over your offering that you have in your hand? I know it might be a paper or envelope or whatever it is, but can you just pray over it and say, God, as I give this, would you bless me? As I give this, would you take care of me? As I give this, would you help me? I want you just to pray that prayer for yourself. God, as I give this, would you help me? Would you help me? Would you bless me? Would you establish me? Would you keep me? In the name of Jesus. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ability to give to you. Lord, as we give, would you remember us tonight on this Friday night? Help us, hear us from heaven. Lord, bless us and keep us. Give us the grace to finish the race. In Jesus' name, amen. What we do at Bridge is we come and we place our envelopes on the stage, on the altar, so you can come from wherever you are and just come and place it.
a couple more things to give you. So right before you run out of here, I promise you, you won't want to miss this. I promise you, you won't want to miss this. I promise you. We have something really special prepared for you. Before we do so, hear these announcements before we come tomorrow. First thing is this. If you are here tonight and you're saying, Pastor, I've been looking to join a community of ladies or a community or a church that feels exactly like this. You're looking for a community and you're saying, I want to connect. Well, tonight you have that opportunity to do so. I want, if you could, you can just scan this QR code right here on this screen. I'm saying, I want to connect to this community. I love what's happening here. I, I feel the presence of God. I've been looking for something just like this. I want you to please just, you know, just scan the QR code. My team will be sure to reach out to you, and we want you to be a part of what God is doing here at Bridge. So it'll take just two seconds. Fill out this QR code. Put your details in there. We'll be sure to reach out to you. So please just scan it real quick and make sure that you fill it out. I don't want you to miss this. We'll have some other opportunities as well tomorrow to even scan this to connect. But I want to start from tonight. You're so touched. You're so changed. You want to connect. Please scan that. We'll be sure to get right to you as soon as the conference finishes. And I want you to know that this is a community that God is building. Amen, somebody. Second thing is this. One thing I love about my creative team is that they have literally provided a cafe for us. And um, not only do they have a cafe, but they have a full, like, they have cafe available upstairs. There's a whole cool menu that they put together. And I want every single one of you to try one of those drinks. So I think there's a drink called um, Dear April as well. I think I, might, I think I might try that one. So make sure I get that in the back. But if you want to, yeah, I, I need to get in the back. It's a really good drink. There, there's so many cool drinks. I think there's a drink that we've um, named after Emmy Moore. I think it's called Gimme Moore or something like that. It's, it's so cool. They have all these cool, cool, cool names. And so get this, just, just chill, get this. All the cafe um, uh, area for you to go and, and kind of get your drink is right up top there. There's a cafe right there. You can go, go get your drinks. Like, go, go, go. The line's going to be really big probably, but make sure you go try one of the drinks at the cafe. We have a cafe right there up top. So you just go up these stairs outside in the lobby, and you go find the cafe. It's a big vibe. But before you do so, again, our creative team has also put together some awesome conference merch that you can get as well. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you clapping because we, like, I didn't hear. I didn't feel the energy. I, I didn't. But we have some conference merch, and we're going to be wearing those hoodies tomorrow morning, all right? So if you want to do something, I want you to make sure that tomorrow when you come, you're rocking your conference merch in the morning. Again, let me tell you this, there are only about a hundred pieces, all right? And so I know that my team has already placed dibs on like 30 of them, so there's only like 70 left, all right? So please make sure you get some conference merch. I want you to rock it tomorrow morning okay so the store also go up these stairs right there and you'll be able to go to our store it's right up there to, the, to your right when you get upstairs it's there the cafe is to your left so you can buy a bunch of stuff upstairs and hold up I'm still speaking hold up hold up hold up I'm still speaking hold up the last thing that I'm going to give you is this Emmy Moore said that she wanted to meet exclusively with creatives who want to influence culture okay so she's doing an exclusive session tomorrow afternoon at 1 15 p.m right after our morning session she'll be meeting all these christian creatives you know there are literally limited spaces but if you want to still be a part of this where you get to meet and greet with her take some pictures or whatever um scan this qr code right there which should be on the screen but it's not but 
If you want to be a part of this exclusive session with Emmy Moore, please just come right to the front here. I'll have one of my team members who will be able to take your details and you can definitely just be a part of what God is doing tomorrow afternoon, okay? So just meet right here in the front. You'll be able to do so. Or even better yet, there's also a way for you to even sign up on our link tree in our bio, okay? So right after we finish, you can either come right here. We'll take your details. You can be a part of that session, and that's going to be awesome, okay? So don't forget, it's going to be great. Last but not the least, we have something that my team has put together. And right after this, we're just going to head out of here. We have an incredible fashion show to show you our conference merch. You ready for it? You sure you're ready? All right. Let's get off the stage so they can cue the fashion show. All right. Come on, wasn't that good? All right, so we love you. Night one in the bag. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Go to the cafe, get some merch. We'll see you in your conference merch in the morning. God bless you. to the front, to the front of stage. Is she backstage? Pass her Olga real quick, or Ollie, so everybody.
and ladies, we found some lost keys. So if you have, I can't quite tell what car it is, but I have a, a car keys. Oh, there we go. Awesome. All right, thank you. Uh, like, huh? Hello? Uh, hello. And for those who've registered for their private session with Emmy Moore tomorrow, you will be getting an email early in the morning with more details. You can pick up some merch and some amazing drinks in the cafe. Both are being sold in the same spot. That is to my right, your left, upstairs. Dear April, how are you guys doing? Hi, my name is Sarah. My name is Liana, and I hope you guys enjoy this conference day one. How did you like it, Sarah? It was so amazing. I like how she talked about how the devil distracts us from sin mm -hmm. and how God is what we should really focus on. Exactly. And I really love that. Jesus is our prize. Jesus is our answer. And honestly, I mean, more, she just brought down the house. The house. The house. The atmosphere in the room was just incredible. God was moving. Oh, I have no words to describe it. No words. I would say it was really moving, really right. moving. That moment of silence. Oh, oh my days. Oh, only God ordained, honestly. Only and God. I hope you guys loved it as much as we did. We love you guys. We love you, women of God. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, today was the session one, as I, we just said. Tomorrow we'll be back here, 9 a.m. 9 a.m.? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. If you weren't there today, you gotta be there tomorrow. Exactly. You gotta be there tomorrow. So there's no time to miss whatever God has, has for us because he's gonna move all weekend. Amen. All weekend. Amen. So tomorrow we'll be here, 9 a.m. for our first session, and then we'll have our meet and greet with Emmy Moore. At uh, what time? Uh, I think one. Two? Two twenty. Check socials. Check socials. Matter of fact, check socials. We shouldn't be telling you guys. You should. You should be updated, up to date. Get mm. on your Zoom. All right. All right. Yes. Yeah, so we have our meeting group with Emmy Moore. Please, you need to re register to be able to get into that session. Check our link tree. With all the influencers, right? Mm. Are you an influencer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> tell them. Talk to them. All right. Yes, she'll be meeting with all the influencers who have bought their tickets. And afterwards, we'll be moving on to our last session, the final session of Dear April. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my like, goodness. Time is going by so fast. And yes. And I, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. I hope you got your tickets for today. I hope Or so. the entire conference for the mean greet. What do you have to tell them? I think if you don't, if you come tomorrow, you will be on your knees. You yes. will be on your knees. Amen. You'll be crying. <laughs> yes, yes, you will. Yes, you will. People crowed. We crowed. Did you cry? <laughs> uh, yes. 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 I cried. I teared up. I was trying to hide it. Not gonna lie, but you know, God is so powerful. But sometimes you can't hold back your tears. Guys, we love you. My name is Liana. My name is Sarah. And we'll see you next time. Next time. Tomorrow Peace. morning. Peace. <laughs> Bye.